Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to ICRT 2020, which is a virtual congress. My name is uh, Gopinath, and I'll be chairing this session on uh, COVID-19. And firstly, I would like to thank the uh, warmth organizations for giving me an opportunity to chair this session. We have two interesting talks. And before I go into the uh, introduction, I would like to say that uh, COVID-19 pandemic has placed uh, significant challenges on our um, healthcare systems worldwide, both in terms of diagnostics and therapeutic nuclear medicine services. And it has changed the way we uh, practice nuclear medicine worldwide. And uh, several national and international bodies have developed uh, several strategies and were implemented globally. And in our next two presentations, we will see how, what are the challenges we have faced and what are the solutions the speakers are going to discuss with us. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Diana Pays, who is, uh, we all know, she is the head of uh, Nuclear Medicine and Diagnostic Imaging Section, Division of uh, Human Health at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And she's going to talk to us about uh, the COVID-19 nuclear medicine uh, short and long-term challenges and how you're going to prepare for it. And she's going to discuss from a global perspective. And uh, she's very passionate about uh, strengthening the relationship between professional organizations to support uh, both education and training worldwide. And uh, she's a passionate uh, nuclear medicine physician. And our next speaker is uh, Professor Faria Nazreen, who is from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, she is a nuclear medicine physician, and also she's the Secretary General of uh, Society of uh, Nuclear Medicine uh, Bangladesh. And uh, she's going to talk to us about the challenges uh, faced and addressed in uh, nuclear medicine departments in Bangladesh. So on, at uh, outset, I would like to thank uh, both the speakers for uh, sharing their experience and knowledge. And I hope uh, this will be an interesting session. And I hope you'll all enjoy. Stay safe and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Diana Paez. I am a nuclear medicine physician and the head of the nuclear medicine and diagnostic imaging section of the Division of Human Health at the International Atomic Energy Agency. I would like to thank the ICRT organizer, Mariela, Parta, Gopi, for inviting me to address you today. During the next 30 minutes, I will talk about how COVID-19 has affected the practice of nuclear medicine worldwide and some of the challenges that we are facing it. We all know that uh, almost a year ago, a group of patients were diagnosed with a typical pneumonia in the Wuhan uh, city in the Hubei province in China. Actually, in December 2019, almost a year ago, the Vision uh, Laboratory, Vision Medical Laboratory in, in China, they analyzed the samples of the patients with this atypical pneumonia and they identified a SARS virus. At the beginning, they thought it was the same a syndrome, acute respiratory syndrome virus that was uh, producing the SARS-1 in, in 2004, but then they realized that it was a new virus. In December 2019, the outbreak of this uh, atypical pneumonia was reported to the WHO regional offices in China, actually 27 patients. And after that, you know the history. So, in January, the 30th of January, the WHO declared this new disease that was called SARS-2 and the, because of the virus and the disease COVID-19 declared the COVID-19 a health emergency of international concern. And on March 11, 2020, this year, it was declared as a pandemic. Unfortunately, as of today, we have had more than 54 million, almost 55 million cases confirmed, and more than 1,300,000 deaths worldwide. All the countries and territories in the world have been affected by this pandemic. So in order to evaluate the situation on how COVID-19 has affected the nuclear medicine practices, the IAEA, in cooperation with colleagues from Germany, uh, Lutz, uh, Freudenberg, and Ken uh, Herman, we conducted an international survey in which 72 countries participated. There were 434 respondents. 
The results of the survey are published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, uh, the issue of September 2020. Majority of the centers of the participating centers were in Europe, 35%, some 30% in Asia, and then the others were distributed around the, the globe. But what did we notice with this service? What we noticed is that the average number of nuclear medicine diagnostic procedures declined worldwide by 54%, more than half. And if we go by or divide by a study, the study we presented, the highest decline was the thyroid study with 67%, followed by the cardiac, myocardial precision imaging. They declined by 66%, bone studies by 60%, and the lung studies by 56%. This is when we are talking about the SPECT. The situation with PET was a little bit different. PET declined actually by 36%, perhaps because of the availability of PET tracers in the same uh, cities or perhaps hospitals. Since this uh, survey was conducted with our colleagues from Germany, we also evaluated the decline in the Sentinel leave node procedures. That was on average, 45%. And how about the therapies? Before going to the therapies, I want to see, to show you this, this graph. You see, this is the, the decline in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, North America, and Oceania. It was more or less similar throughout the world. Perhaps Latin America was the one with the highest decrease in all the procedures, ranging from 71, 75%, but I want to call your attention to something that is interesting in Latin America, the PET studies also declined. Important to mention that the survey was conducted at the end of April, beginning of March, when the number of cases detected in the Americas as a whole, and in Latin America in particular, was not so high. They reached the peak more or less in, in June, so we conducted the survey a little bit earlier. but most of the countries were already under lockdowns. Just to highlight, the decline in the, in the number of procedures was higher in Latin America if we compare to the rest of the world. And how about Asia and the Pacific? If you analyze the case of Singapore, South Korea, and Japan versus the rest of the countries of the regions, you can notice a huge difference. Singapore, South Korea, and Japan were not very much affected if we compare to the to the rest of the countries. You can see in the graph, for instance, pet CT declined 44% in Asia, but only 22% in these countries. And in the other procedure, it was only by one third. 21 versus 62 for the bone, 26, 68 for the cardiac, 23, 65 for the lung, and you can see the numbers on the screen. Interesting. We don't know the reason behind that. Perhaps Singapore, South Korea, and Japan, they were affected earlier. So when we conducted the, the survey, most probably they were already accustomed to deal with the, the, the pandemic. Now, let me talk about the radionuclide therapies. In average, the radionuclide therapies declined a little bit close to 50%, some 47%, including all the therapies. If we analyze by the different types of therapies, the thyroid therapies declined in average 45%. The benign pathologies were the ones that were uh, more affected, like hyperthyroidism, 63%, versus 47% for the well-differentiated thyroid cancer. The SIRT declined by 40%, prostate by 38%. Why is that? Perhaps because out of the 430 something centers that participated in the studies, not many centers perform SRIT or prostate uh, therapies. Since uh, I mentioned before, this survey was conducted with the colleagues from Germany, and from them, for them, the radiosinovectomy is a quite frequent procedure. We also evaluated the decline in the radiosinovectomy. This is the, the average decline of the radionuclide therapies. 
the, the first group of bars is the, the global decline. And in this case, I selected some of the participating countries. And I would like to highlight again the case of Latin America. My own country, Colombia, was pretty badly affected. Same uh, the case for Pakistan. You can see the title, benign title conditions were the ones that are represented in, in orange. Orange are the ones that were uh, most affected. And how about the, the orders for molybdenum and technician? It was expected if they were under lockdown and they have declined in the procedures, the orders for uh, molybdenum technician generators what also was also reduced. In average, more or less 40% of the orders were cancelled. But what is important to highlight is that the problem, problem was not only the orders, the problem was the supply chain. Most of the centers were not able to receive the generators. That is why perhaps the PET CT scans were affected to a lesser extent than the nuclear medicine general procedures because of the availability of technician generators. So in the graph, you can see how in general, most of the participating centers in most of the countries, they actually reduce the orders of generators. What I was mentioning before, the main issue was the supply chain. So one of the questions of our survey was if the supply of essential materials was adequate during the pandemic. And as you can see, almost this is the, the number of respondents. So that is why it's 200, no 100. So almost half of the uh, respondents have problems with the supply of the molybdenum. Same for iron 131. As if you compare here with the FTG, the, there was less affected or they were less affected for the uh, FDG more for gallium 67 or lutetium or other therapies. So this is the, the uh, graph in which we are presenting how different regions were affected. And Africa, Oceania, look, the, the blue are the generators. So they were 60% of the supplies of generators they were not able to receive. Again, Latin America, almost 70% of the centers had problems with the supply change, which actually is, is really difficult to, to be able to address. We also conducted a survey evaluating how the diagnosis of heart diseases worldwide was affected. In this case, we wanted to include not only nuclear medicine, but all the diagnostic modalities used for heart disease. So we included uh, electrocardiogram, stress echo, CT, MR, and even ANGIO. Those are the, the countries represented by region, Africa, Eastern Europe, Asia, Latin America, and this is the worldwide. So in the case of this survey that will be published in the Journal of uh, American College of Cardiology in JAC, uh, it will be perhaps in a couple of weeks available online. We asked them to compare the number of procedures that they practice or they perform during March 2019 versus the number of procedures in March 2020 and in April 2020. The one in red is April 2020. And you see how, in average, the decline in the diagnosis of heart disease, all the procedure was almost 64%. This is terrible. We are seeing the consequences of, of the delay in the diagnosis. We are seeing patients with, with uh, uh, more complications, with even um, uh, myocardial ruptures that we haven't seen in years. And it's because of the delay. Why this delay? Perhaps several reasons. One could be that they didn't receive the generators to perform the MPI in the case of myocardial perfusion imaging. But what about CT or MR? The main issue was that most of the patients were very afraid to go to the hospital, to seek for proper care. So it is essential to us to stress the fact that if you have any heart condition, you have to go to the, to the hospital immediately. 
despite of the pandemic. So this is uh, the, the impact of the stress nuclear studies that are presented here. We divided stress uh, biocardial perfusion imaging and stress PET. The same case as in general nuclear medicine. The nuclear medicine SPECT studies had a higher impact than the PET studies. But in the graph, you can see also how the stress echo, for instance, uh, the stress EKG also were uh, affected during the pandemic. So what did we do, the agency? In, order, in addition to conducting these uh, two surveys and to make this information available and to try to plan some interventions, like for instance, working with the WHO to include the molybdenum technician generators as, as part of the essential medicines. We conducted a series of webinars with the support of professional organizations, including the WORM. So the first webinar was in March 25th, the second one in May 13th, and the third one in April 26th. It was a sequence. In the first one, we wanted to understand what was the situation. In the second one, we released some a guidance on how to continue operating while protecting the patients. And in the third one, we uh, focus on how to reopen after the first peak of the pandemic. As a result of the webinars, we also have a couple of uh, publications in the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine. I strongly recommend you to take a look of these uh, documents because they present a good guidance for the nuclear medicine department so we can continue providing the essential services without uh, risking the security of our staff, our patients, and the general public as a whole. So the first uh, document was published on 15 April. Actually, we started the lockdown in most of the countries in Europe in March. So by April, the first publication was already available online. It was really the contribution of an outstanding group of people. In this operational uh, guidance, what we have is a series of steps that will guide the nuclear medicine departments on how to continue operating, as I mentioned before. So we divide it in governance, the use of resources, the provision of services, the patient flow, the supplies, and very important, how to protect the staff. So I'm not going to go into detail. I will strongly recommend you to take a look of the publication. As I mentioned, it was published as an editorial in the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine. Actually, Opi was one of the co-authors and Opi was also one of the speakers. The second presentation, the second publication, also an editorial in the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine, is about how to go back to what we call normality or the new normal. So it's to continue operating after the peak or during the pandemic. In this one, it, was a, it is a very nice article that I also strongly recommend you. We divide in phases. So there is the red phase, the amber phase, and the green phase based on the number or the phase of the pandemic through which the different cities or countries are uh, going through. So if you have the red phase, meaning you are in the lockdown, there are some specific recommendations. Then the same for the amber phase and for the green phase. Actually, it's green and I put blue. So it's not very amber phase, it's green. So the green phase is when you just have to go to, to what many countries, mainly in Europe, were going through uh, during June, July. Now in Europe, we are going back to the red phase where several restrictions are applied. So because of the time, I'm not going to go into details, but I really strongly recommend you to take a look of these publications. We also publish uh, clinical guidance uh, here in the IAEA, also freely available. And this one has very detailed information of the entire process, the entire flow from patient arrival until the patient goes home how to clean the equipment is a very detailed guideline that was uh, provide or developed in, in cooperation with the uh, European Association of Nuclear Medicine, the International Society of uh, uh, Nuclear Medicine Technologies, and the World Federation of Nuclear Medicine and Biology. 
Freely accessible is an, is an IAEA publication. Go there, visit the site, take a look, because this is applicable throughout all stages of the pandemic. You know, we are going up and down. We know that until we don't have a vaccine that locally seems to be that there are already three vaccines that are uh, that are going to be available for vaccination very soon. But you never know when the publication will develop the, the immunity. So, and it will be useful for any, any other situation, any outbreak of any infectious diseases that unfortunately we are seeing more and more. But this is just uh, information about some of the IAEA tools. We have this tool that is called Imagine. It's a database on the nuclear medicine and radiology departments. And I just want to show this just to tell you the, the disparities in access to nuclear medicine in general. This is the number of SPECT and PET scanner per million inhabitants. So if you see in the US, the number of uh, SPECT scanners is 18 million per million, 18, 18 scanners per million inhabitants. While if you go to the, to the uh, Africa, there are only 1.7 SPECT and 0.5 PET scanners. Why I am mentioning this during a COVID presentation? Because we are a nuclear medicine community and we need to be aware of the inequities in access to nuclear medicine in order to provide a solution. So what I wanted to mention is not only that we are facing a very important challenge as a community to be able to face the COVID and continue providing the services, but we are also facing a challenge that is even higher. That is the, the inequity in the access to nuclear medicine and density. According to the international recommendations, there should be one to two PET scanners per million inhabitants. You see, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.01. So we as community we should, we should work collectively. And perhaps with WARM, we can do the same kind of survey for the availability of uh, radionuclide therapy. Also, the IAEA is supporting the development of health economics uh, models to evaluate the impact of medical imaging and radionuclide therapies in the management of cancer patients. Recently, we published this article in The Lancet in cooperation with professional organizations, both nuclear medicine and radiology, and the colleagues from Harvard. There is another article that was published uh, recently. You see the second one, the medical science monitoring, where you can have some statistical models on how to estimate the need for a particular medical imaging modality, PET-CT, MRI. So I just uh, want to conclude by first of all thanking you for inviting me to this uh, important conference and to mention that we are facing challenging times, but adaptation is the key to survival. We as community need to be able to adapt to the new situation. If we see that we have problems with the uh, supply chain, we need to work collectively to see how can we address that. Perhaps if the availability of pet tracer is better, maybe we can work collectively and in increase or strengthen the applications of PET-CT. We need to evaluate the operational processes in our services because we usually as physicians, we take care of the clinical details, but we don't really look at the administrative process. Do we have enough supplies? Do we have a supply chain that is proved to work in, in, in difficult situations? And again, I mentioned to you, Definitely, we need to work collectively. I really appreciate very much the invitation and thank you for your time. And I wish you much success during this international conference. Thank you. Greetings from Bangladesh. Before starting my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers of ICRT 2020 for inviting me for this presentation in this COVID-19 situation. I'm Dr. Faria Nasri, uh, Professor of National Institute of Nuclear Medicine and Allied Sciences, Dhaka. 
Today, I'm going to speak about challenges faced and addressed in the preparedness of the COVID-19 situation in nuclear medicine departments in Bangladesh. The corona wave has hit the entire world. Bangladesh is of no exception. The nuclear medicine departments of Bangladesh had to cope with this unprecedented situation with its own ability. So we begin. China first officially declared their first corona case on 19th December, uh, sorry, 31st December 2019. And Bangladesh declared their first case on 8th March 2020. The COVID-19 has invaded the whole world is highly infectious, causing serious health problems. Till now, we don't have any effective approved drug and no vaccine. So we're fighting against our invisible enemy. The World Health Organization declared the outbreak of COVID-19 as a public health emergency on 30 January 2020 and 11th March 2020. Facts for COVID-19 in Bangladesh, as I said, the confirmed case was on 8th March. The first coronavirus death was on 18th March 2020. General holiday or lockdown was declared by the government from 26 March to 4th April, which was later extended up to 30th May 2020. Cases were confirmed in all 64 districts on May 2020. Bangladesh is a very overpopulated country, having a population density of 1,265 persons per square kilometer. So it is a very difficult situation to control COVID in such an overpopulated country. The COVID scenario in Bangladesh, this is from 9th November 2020, who dashboard. In respect of cases, it was Bangladesh who has the 22nd position, and in respect of deaths, it's in the 31st position. The male to female ratio is quite similar like other countries of the world. And till 9th November, the death was 6,092 and we lost 103 doctors. The response to COVID, it's international, national and institutional. Regarding institutional, there are 15 nuclear medicine facilities it is under the umbrella of Bangladesh Atomic Energy Commission, two under government and five under private sector. The institutional challenges were preparing the nuclear medicine departments, preparing for personal protection, training of personnel of different categories, triage of patients, asset of supply, backlog of patients, continuation of work with several persons being in quarantine or isolation due to COVID-19. What we did, we paused, think, decide, arrange, prepare, and cope with the new normal life. We had to pause from 24th March 2020 for a while. We had to think, we had no idea. We arranged Zoom meetings where we exchanged our views, take help from international guidelines and COVID-19 related webinars, made some important decisions to move forward in this unprecedented situation. The decisions we made, make arrangements for personal protective equipments, change and modify the settings of our departments and laboratories suitable to maintain social distancing and personal hygiene, rethinking and rescheduling patients of all department, training personnel of different categories regarding personal protection and other COVID issues. This was the distribution of PPE in all 15 centers and the private sectors arranged their own PPE. For hand hygiene, facilities ensuring hand washing with sanitizer and soap were ensured. Hand hygiene stations such as hand washing and hand rub dispensers were put in prominent places around the workplace and made accessible to all staff. Uh, these are some innovative methods that we took. Uh, this is a pedal operated basin. When we press one, this the water comes out and when you press this, the soap comes out. So any person entering the premises of the hospital that may be the patient patient, doctor, stuff, they can wash their hands without touching uh, anything. And this is the toilet of a patient. This is also pedal operated commode flush. So we arrange minimal hand touching system. Our in vitro division produced our own hand sanitizer when there was a scarcity of all these sanitizers. And they supplied not only us, but also the nuclear medicine facilities 
uh, elsewhere, and also in hospitals in other health sectors. It helps us, it helped us a lot. The physical distancing, changing patient appointment system, spacing and maintaining patient queue, arranging waiting areas to maintain optimum distance, and no mask, no entry. These are uh, red lines, which are three feet apart. So all the patients coming in the department had to wait with their physical distance. And these are the phone numbers which were given online. So every patient can have their appointment without physically appearing. And those who did not have any online access, these posters were uh, installed in front of the premises so they can get the telephone numbers and the instructions to get appointment. The security guard is calling the names in small groups so they can enter the hospital premise. And before entering the lift or entering the hospital, they had their thermal scanner with, for the body temperature measurement. This is the city arrangement of the patients with ribbons. We made the physical distancing and some made with the floor marking. Each institute made their own way. Arranging the setup of the reception areas and departments, these shields, physical barriers, they, these were not present before. We installed all these things with red marking for physical distancing. Here, the follow-up of patient is done behind the barrier. The history taking of patient is also done behind the barrier. This is the in vitro division collecting blood samples. This is the PET CT division with proper PPE. They are scanning the patient. These are the scintigraphy division. All patients are wearing masks and all the technologists are wearing proper PP. We also have an ultrasound division. Here we have disposable bed rolls and here you can see a plastic transparent sheet and there is an opening through which the doctor can enter the hand to scan the patient. So minimal uh, touch is here. Training of personnel of different categories, including doctors, physicists, technologists, nurses, security drivers, cleaners. All of these people have different job description. So their training these sessions were also different. This is one training session going on before uh, starting our work. We developed our standard operating procedures in different divisions to minimize risk to staff, patients, and control the transmission of virus. Scheduling of patients, Patients were screened by history of a telephone, triage of COVID-19 risk patients, scheduled tests were postponed if there was any potential risk of COVID, confirmation was made for every patient the day before the scan, patients were scheduled on slots to avoid gathering. On arrival, temperatures were measured by the thermal scanner, masks were ensured, hand hygiene was maintained, rapid and minimum contact protocols were used, Minimum waiting time, allowing only one caregiver if needed, quick disposable of patients. This is the individual management of the Pet City Division. Uh, there was online appointment, medical history, previous investigations were seen online. All pre-test preparation instructions were given online. Patients were counseled for social distancing at least 14 days prior to the scheduled scan. Patient was notified or declined, had to notify or declare the history of contacts, if any, even if they had any COVID-19 symptoms. And RT-PCR for COVID-19 was advised if there were urgent recruited patients or if they were suspected to have COVID or have positive contact. Page city were performed by two set of technologists, one set dedicated for dose preparation, injection, patient positioning, and patient disposal, and the other set were for acquisition of scan. Rest of all institutional protocols were safe, and we had also special safety protocol for COVID-19 positive cases. Patient management in thyroid division. Thyroid division has to deal with a load of patients because we have very much follow-up patients. This was a previous picture. Patient used to appear physically and have their follow-up. But now we don't do this. We have introduced telemedicine from April onwards, and all the follow-up patients are giving, uh, help, taking help from telemedicine. Radioiodine therapy for CA thyroid patients were postponed for three months due to unavailability of the isotope. Patients were counseled at the time and assured for the delay. After availability of the isotope, high-risk group of TTC patients were prioritized. Comorbidities were assessed. 
patients with immunosuppressions were assessed. Before therapy, patients were counseled for social distancing during levothyroxine withdrawal to inform if there were contacts of COVID-19 in the family, to inform if there were symptoms of COVID-19 and COVID-19 test if possible before therapy. During and after therapy, the therapy was done with proper PPE. Patient followed the rules of isolation of the therapy as usual. Follow up of the patients by telemedicine who received radioiodine therapy. Radioiodine therapy for hypothyroidism, non urgent cases were withheld. Patients who were unable to tolerate anti thyroid medications were given priority. Patients with delay in treatment would cause more harm were considered. For the nuclear cardiology department, fortunately, there were not so much backlog. Myocardial perfusion started as soon as isotope was available. Exercise stress was avoided. Pharmacological stress was performed by adenosine. For the scintigraphy division, urgent studies were performed. Preference was given to inpatients and emergency cases. Non-essential nuclear medicine studies were downscaled accordingly. Lung perfusion scan was done only. For the academic purpose, the courses were mainly running online. Practical trainings were given in small groups with proper protection. For each institution, there should be a focal point dealing with the incidence of COVID-19 patients. As we have 15 nuclear medicine facilities, Bangladesh Atomic Energy Commission formed a quick response team on 8 June 2020, comprising of 12 members, including eight nuclear medicine doctors. They did not only deal with the nuclear medicine people, but also all the employees of Bangladesh Atomic Energy Commission, that is more than 2,000. These are the members of the team, and I'm the convener. We have pulmonologists, radiologists, young doctors, also administration, accounts, and ambulance. The work description of this response team was involved to guide the corona-affected persons or suspected persons in Bangladesh Atomic Energy Commission, help to hospitalize patients with ambulance service, keep information about the patients and collect the medical forms, issue clearance certificate for joining in their workplace after being COVID negative. We also upgraded ourselves by online courses for the clinical management of coronavirus. This is the medical form that we gave to each patient so that we can have the blood group for future reference for plasma donor. We had a monthly report form each institute would provide us so we can keep a record. This is the a clearance certificate that we give to every patient before joining their institute. Until now, we have dealt with more than 90 patients till now, and 11 were hospitalized, and unfortunately, there was one death. The scenario of nuclear medicine department till 9th November 2020, 52 personnel were affected. Among them, 18 were doctors, including one private sector, and seven were hospitalized. The stress that we are going through, like all people, we are coping with the mental stress by advocating positive attitude, follow health recommendations, limit social media consuming, act with kindness and grace, and find fun activities, especially indoor. We hope this is temporary, but we don't know. We are all in this together, even if we can't hold our hands right now. But we think we can cope with it and overcome with it. Thank you very much for the patience hearing, and I salute the frontliners of this COVID-19 battle. Thank you.